namaste thomas welcome welcome to ahimsa conversations thank you for making the time um so what is what would be the earliest memory you have of either the concept or the experience of ahimsa the i think the concept and the experience came together in one package uh i have a very it's it's a, a very clear very vivid uh and very inspiring memory for me the year was 1979 i was 21 years old a student of philosophy at helsinki university um and i was searching for ways of life in which my need to contribute to a more just world could somehow be fulfilled it was also a time of the um uh, the early time of the new green movement uh, in europe searching for ways to overcome the the problems we were facing through industrial growth society as we like to call it so this was spring 1979 and in finland there was a movement uh which was launched uh in that spring uh which became very important for the uh for the formation of the environmental consciousness in finland part of the new green movement this is before the party formations uh so there was the direct action there was koyarvi that's the name of a lake in southern finland central southern finland um there was uh, a plan to uh, uh to uh, uh to build uh, uh sorry to um sort of my english <laughs> uh there was a plan uh or a, a ditch made uh to uh, uh create fields from that lake you know it was it was a birds lake very valuable precious birds lake and the uh and it was threatened by uh, agriculture development so some people some environmentalists from uh, various parts of finland went there to build a dam in that ditch uh it was covered in the press i didn't know the people there but i hitchhiked to this site when i saw the first news coverage and on arrival there uh the new arrivals were explained the rules of the camp and i think at that in that very first moment arriving in the camp there were references to gandhi ahimsa satyagraha non violence direct action said there was a very and i can't remember exactly who said what but in the weeks that followed it's very clear that the new environmental movement in the nordic countries was gandhian it was a non-violent movement it was committed to civil disobedience it was committed to the force of truth it was inspired by gandhi mainly through the norwegian influences in norway in the 50s and 60s there had been a eco philosophical reception of gandhi both in theory and in practice the big names known to the world are arnes sigmund kvale johan galtung but a lot of active activists was there and it's quite important i think for understanding the presence of ahimsa and satyagraha in the western world that this influence that came to koyarvi that action site a uh, small action site with a few hundred people in south finland in 1979 that influence came through oral tradition more than through written tradition the theoretical background was quite strong but what we learned there together was uh, about gandhi about ahimsa about nonviolence as a practice and later on we would read more about it so that's how it came to me as one one very happy uh, inspiring package in the spring 1979 lovely and this went on i think very largely to shape your work ongoing your later work uh, as a scholar as a teacher as a political activist so would you like to elaborate on that uh, yes so how it shaped uh, maybe the following 3 4 decades of your life that's right um and uh, let me emphasize that it wasn't only an individual experience it was a collective experience uh, i have uh, daily contact with many of the people from that time uh, people in finland but also the movement saw itself as part of a global movement of course it was finnish nordic the nordic aspect was very strong uh and in the early times when uh, th- there's record to there's a prehistory and and the thing that came later before the 1979 experience i was one of those 
young idealistic people, and so many of us are, who is not an idealist when you're 10 years old, who are so afflicted by the, uh, when you wake up to the understanding that I come from a part of the world in which so many things are fine. And when I, when you, when I was 10 years old, I was shown pictures from, uh, from the war in Biafra, this was 1968-69. Uh, there was a conflict in Nigeria, it called starvation. We saw in, this, in my school, I went to uh, my first year in secondary school, and we were shown pictures from that site of conflict with starving children. And you wake up, you come from this privileged, rich northern country, and you wake up to the injustice, injustice of the world. So there's a painful time between 1969 and 1979 when I was searching for, for tools, existential survival in a world which has pain and conflict and injustice, which is unfathomable to a child and which is simply unacceptable. So you confront what some might call the, the absolute negative in the world. You do it as a child with very little uh, resources to face it. So you look, how can I, how can you live with this terrible pain that the world is not what you would like it to be, that's unacceptable about it to you? In this search, so there's a bit of search between 69 and 70, how can I grow up? How can I live uh, as one privileged white male in a world so full of injustice? Uh, and then gradually the things that saved me were theory, which would explain how this is possible. I remember reading as 13, 14 year old about Johan Galtung and structural violence. I went to the UN Association in Finland. There was a woman called Hilka Pietila, very charismatic, active in the United Nations uh, women's movement. Um, uh, so these people had an analysis of structural violence, which explained to me what the world is like. That's one thing, but they were also engaged. They were edu uh, education for peace and solidarity. I became part of that, active in that. Uh, so I was also given the privilege of having access to people and access to organizations who took it on them to try to change the world. So this was the second exposure to something that was life-saving for me in an essentially uh, fundamental way, that you can have theories which explain what's happening and you can have practical efforts to change what's happening. So I was lucky to be exposed to that in some way and become, we had in my school, a very nice group of friends who tried to, through what we called a day of work for, to give to the poor, etc. We had all kinds of quite primitive, but existentially, morally, very deeply engaging experiences of the time. And Koyervi seemed to be the new environmental movement in Finland. It wasn't only about the Bird's Lake. It was about changing the way of life in our part of the world to be compatible with global justice. That was, and global justice for the poor in the South, as we then saw it, we had the North-South divide was on everybody's lips. And we had the human nature divide that humans were and still are, of course, uh, destroying uh, the life conditions of other spe uh, species and the life conditions of so many poor. So that's the background. Uh, uh, that uh, made all this so important to me. Um, but then, 79, we had a movement uh, which we thought would had a message, voluntary simplicity, it was called in the US, I think, alternative lifestyle, we call it. We had a vision of a change of the way of life, which would be beneficial to all of us. We would have less consumption, a more truth, more moral fulfillment. That was the vision. We thought it was so obvious that what the new movements offered was a vision of a better life, more simple, uh, less material, but politically, democratically, spiritually, much more fulfilling. And then the shock, so that was 79 to 83. And the shock was the way the world responded. We thought everybody would come to us, you know, our <laughs> everybody joined just overnight That's so like obvious. that. Yeah, yeah, the obvious thing was there. It was invented, we thought, no. So the answers are there, so why doesn't everybody come? <laughs> and then it didn't happen, not everybody came. And that, that then became the moment, the need for philosophy for me. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how is it that not everybody, everybody comes? Uh, 
Yeah. Where in the sequence did Hind Swaraj happen? Because Hinswaraj. I have a feeling that that was yes. a major milestone in this journey. Absolutely. Hind Swaraj came twice. It came in the early years, 1790-83, as, as an articulation of uh, maybe the best and the earliest articulation that was available to us of what was so desperately needed. Namely, it was a concrete vision of a life in which nonviolence, democracy, and justice, global justice and solidarity can be realized. So that was the, uh, that was the political vision that somehow we intuitively shared, but which Gandhi articulated so well in, so it was, but it was more like, um, uh, I didn't read it seriously at the time. Uh, the serious reading came in the early nineties, uh, when I had been 10 years with, uh, when, you know, looking for the theoretical tools to understand why the modern world doesn't change more easily. Why is the modern world so committed to growth when it growth is so terribly unjust and so terribly destructive? To understand that, I went to the Frankfurt School, it's called part of the critical theory of, uh, uh, of the Frankfurt School tradition in philosophy and social theory. So I went in, in uh, I did my master's in the early 80s on Habermas's epistemology, Jürgen Habermas, second generation Frankfurt School philosopher, uh, pupil of Theodor Adorno, Max Horkheimer, Herbert Marcuse and these people. So I did, I started work on Habermas. I went to his uh, class to start my PhD work in 1983, 84. So I was in Germany, 83, 84, studying critical theory. And later, th that was a time of debate between French and German critical theorists. In France, there was Michel Foucault, there were others, there were, uh, there were Derrida, there was Lyotard, uh, they were, you know, it was a big thing, the debate between the French and the German uh, traditions in critical theory, how to, they were struggling how to understand the crisis of modernity. That was the concept we learned. And in, then in, in dealing with the disappointment or the shortcomings, the philosophical shortcomings of that debate, I went back to Hinz Varaj and, and I have been very proudly been editing translations of Hinz Varaj into four languages into Czech and Latvian and, <laughs> and Swedish and Finnish. A uh, very great experience where uh, I can go into detail if you like, but there was something there in, in Swaraj, which my friend colleague now sadly deceased, Suresh Sharma in Delhi, uh, Suresh called, uh, said one of Gandhi's and Hind Swaraj's um, uh, privileges or one one source, one reason for its importance is that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't accept the normative standards of modernity as the you know, ultimate universal standards. That offers a larger vision of uh, normativity of, uh, and of possible normative standards than we can find in, in, in the critical theory uh, of Europe at the time. So that was in that, in that range of search and attention, how to overcome the limits of the best critical theory we had in Europe at the time. In that framework, Hinz Varaj had a place. And also Wittgenstein, as we can, Ludwig Wittgenstein, my early philosophical love, also came back to me in the same time, the search to overcome what I saw as some bottlenecks in the, in the development of the critical theory modernity that was needed from my perspective in order to understand why mm. the movement for Ahimsa, for nonviolence, for solidarity could not achieve as quickly and as much as I thought in 1979 would be natural, inevitable, and very happy for all of us. Mm. So that, that is then the later part. Yeah, but in the subsequent now, I, well, almost 25 years or more, um, how do you feel today? Because I am still, I'm aware of how deep an impact uh, this discourse arising from Hind Swaraj had on groups of activists, I think in the Northern world, not just limited to Finland, uh, because as you said, it's been translated into so many languages. But where do we stand today? 
uh, is there a greater acceptance and a greater um, uh, you know kind of taking as a foundation stone uh, the need for a non-violence anchored uh, both theory and practice or has that not happened or, or what has happened I, I don't want to limit the question to a yes yeah, or yeah well that's a difficult question I think um, already at the time in 1905 is that the year uh, or was it, was it um, 1909 1908 09 yeah November yeah. November December 08 that's right yeah. and then published in 1909 yeah. that was the voyage in Kelowna Castle when Gandhi wrote on his way back from London on a voyage he wrote in Swaraj uh, already at that time and and all through the or even hundred years before, there's a tension in 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 the modern world between the ideals it pledges, justice, uh, respect for everyone, respect for life, and the practice, uh, which uh, so often becomes so destructive. So the the gulf between the world that promised to us and the world that we have was very great already in Gandhi's time. What the British, I mean, what you could find in the in the Gospels, uh, the moral standards you could find access to in the Gospels, accessible to the British, to the colonialists, the, yes. the, uh, and also the theoretical foundations for a democratic uh, way of life was there in Socrates already. Gandhi read the Socratic ap uh, Apology uh, in Britain in uh, 1890s. He read the Gospels, so he knew that in the Western world, maybe in all cultures, that's one of Gandhi's geniuses that you can see in all cultures, roots of a of a, a of a morality which allows us to respect all life and allows us to commit nonviolence. You could find this also in the Western world. You could find these standards, and the gulf between what those standards imply and what happens in reality is so huge, and that gulf, I think is bigger now. It was bigger in 1979 than it was in 1908. Uh, and it's bigger now than it was in 2021. Uh, I, have a, uh, I have a phrase for that, uh, a phrase which I think helps, may help guide our, uh, our effort and need to deal with this gulf. And that is that the, it's part of the, it's, it's part of the tragedy and the success, the grandeur et misère, as Charles Taylor calls it, of the, of the Western experience, that uh, it is the, among all civilizations, it has a record in hiding the, the costs of its success. So people can, so many of us can experience the success of, the, of, of modernization uh, without, Really facing the losses, yeah, or and being I think that aware of them. Even, even, even that—that that is how we hide so. The one who hides so well, the cost of its success. Yeah. So that is, and I think that I do think that that nonviolent action, action in the spirit and, and the practice of satyagraha half truth force, has the can have the power to make us see what's at, at the end of the fork, to make us see the what uh, actually lies behind the success, which is so vividly, so eloquently, so overwhelmingly uh, forcefully presented to us. Yeah. So we need people to take action, but it's very, very difficult. The gulf is so huge. And the mechanism which make us see the success those of us who live like me in the privileged, you know, mostly, you know, the comfortable Western uh, life of a university professor uh, or anyone, even, you know, ordinary people in Finland, how, how can we understand our real relation, our material and our moral rela relation to the suffering in the world? It's not easy. Let yeah. me give a, a very painful, I can, well, tell me, sorry. No. I was just wondering, uh, Thomas, if the climate crisis and the fact that its its impacts are happening now, in fact, they're on the news today, uh, you know, with the flooding that has happened, that's one. And the other is the rise of uh, depression 
as mm. an ailment, an anxiety-based mm. uh, and anxiety disorders. Uh, mm. And I'm referring particularly to the US. Uh, I don't know much about the data out of Western Europe. Um, and that they are not just among adults and teenagers, but now there is data showing anxiety disorders and depression among preteen children. Mm -hmm. Now, is this likely to uh, raise uh, awareness about the, the dark side of the so-called success mm -hmm. of modernity? I'm just wondering. Or are they going to be seen as aberrations, as... Uh, mm -hmm. some unpredicted uh, you know side effects which we can fix with medication is, is what 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 is what do you see happening well there's yeah um, the up uh, first the empirical fact uh, facts are on <laughs> your side on the side of the critics um, if we just take a look at the uh, at what was in 70s called computerization uh, we look now at the, you know, at the IT boom. Um, it is an empirical fact that uh, that depression uh, and uh, time spent in social media, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and this TikTok, etc., that there's a correlation. The more time spent on social media, the more depression, and this, of course, affects also very young people, even children. So that that is there. But this fact doesn't so far, uh, and of course it's not the the the, the causal relations are not self-evident, so it's not it's not a straightforward thing. Uh, but there is need a reason to worry. Um, but there is at the core of the Western experience is a very strong resistance to to see that relation as important. There's a very strong, and I think it's grounded in the fantasy of, of technology uh, as uh, solutions to problems, as bringing solutions to problems. And this, that's why I have needed, I mean, this is, if I may come back to my philosophical journey after 1979, Please. and I mentioned three names. If I mention Jürgen Habermas, the, one of the great critical theorists from our part of the world last 50 years, uh, if I mention then uh, Gandhi and I mention Ludwig Wittgenstein again, the Austrian British philosopher, uh, then I think in all these cases, the way technology comes in and the way the question of, uh, of for instance, social media, why is it that, it that we don't make the connection? We see the connection is there, in particular, it's well documented. And still, there's very little critique. Still, new technology, digital digitization of the universities, of the school system, of health, uh, of the health uh, care in Finland is constantly still uh, brought forward as progress, as liberating, as emancipatory, as promoting ability to realize a just world. Why is it that this that the practice is so technology friendly and the record, the empirical record, isn't really speaking in favor of that policy. How has that come about? And I think mm, that, that was my original disappointment with the critical theory of Foucault and Habermas and these people, that there was never a real critique of technology. Technology has been seen since Francis Bacon's time, since early modern times as a realization of reason, as sort of natural science becoming flesh and blood. With natural science, we can understand the world, we can see the causal connections with technology, we can use the understanding brought by the knowledge brought by social by, by science to tame nature for our needs. So technology was seen as realization of reason and reason is a good thing. So how can you be critical of technology? Are you against reason? So this has been the now, I have needed Gandhi, Wittgenstein, and Socrates uh, uh, to understand this failure of the modern world to take the problematic side of technology seriously. Um, that, uh, and I think Gandhi there, 
uh, articulates the truth of what is now called the degrowth movement. We have been to degrowth conference together, right? And so we have seen this. Yes. It's very popular in the degrowth movement to say, as we said in the 70s in Nordic countries, that industrial growth is impossible because of physical limits to growth. That you know there will be depletion of all resources and then there will be a collapse, blah, blah. Now, I think technology, and this is a Habermas argument, we cannot know beforehand the limits of technological development. Maybe renewables will be there, maybe sun energy, maybe whatever geothermic energy, maybe the energy problem can be solved without. So maybe the physical limits to growth are not there, maybe. But there's a, there's a human limit to technology, namely, and this is what Gandhi detects in Hinsvaraj, and that's why Hinsvaraj has been so important to me, that Gandhi claims that we have to understand, in order for democracy and freedom and truth to be real, we have to have not only a theoretical possibility, but a real grounded capacity to understand our action and the consequence of our action. And that we can only do inside its scale of which is fathomable to us. Yeah. So it's more like the limited human being. In theory, we can control everything. In practice, understand requires a smaller scale. So that is the Himswaraj message on technology. Not that technology is bad, but it makes life too complex and we can't deal with it. We become completely confused as, as Gandhi says in Himswaraj. And, he, and more critically that we must at only within that scale can we grasp who we are asking to pay the price for what. Yes. yes and, it's so, and, and so maybe if you could then also dwell on the uh, Gandhi's emphatic position against vivisection and yeah. the, that, that, that his opposition to a scientific paradigm that almost rests on um, willingly inflicting pain on living beings in order to know more. Yes, I think Gandhi, there is, I mean, it is a question of, of violence, isn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, and whether, you know, a means ends morality. That is, by the way, that's where Wittgenstein, I think, adds something to, to Gandhi, uh, not, in, not, in, in, not in, the, uh, in the theory of that. Uh, Wittgenstein and Gandhi shared a hero. They both were greatly inspired by Leo Tolstoy as young. And Leo Tolstoy's uh, interpretation of the, of the Gospels. So this is what Gandhi and Wittgenstein shared. Uh, uh, Gandhi died in 48, Wittgenstein in 51. They lived parallel lives. Uh, both were, you know, geniuses of their kinds. I think Gandhi, for me, is, you know, <laughs> uh, he's uh, even greater because of his practice. But Wittgenstein, in, in, in the philosophical realm, he's the greatest genius we've had. He came to, as a young student of math, he came to Cambridge to study with a man called Bertrand Russell, who was a big philosopher in Britain at the time. And they had the problem, they wanted to found foundations of reason. They wanted to show that logic, that we can make, the, there can be a philosophy of logic, which is the first philosophy. It gives reason its real and ultimate foundations. What Wittgenstein gradually, to make a long story very short, what I think happened in Wittgenstein, uh, as he came to, he became the star pupil of Russell, he wrote out a book in 1921, he was a young man, a book which made him, you know, the philosopher of the century. The book was called Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. He thought he had solved all the problems of philosophy. Uh, he went to live as a school teacher in the Austrian mountains. Then he came back, no, my, my solutions were not as good as I thought, I have to rethink. And he rethought, and what he discovered was that logical necessity, mathematical truth is not timeless. Uh, the and the deepest forms of necessity, the deepest forms of reason and truth are not to find in some eternal realm of math. They're not defined in the laws of nature. The, uh, the most foundational, the most basic and the most, um, the ultimate sort of form of reason is there in human conversation. It's in what we say, in how we can agree, how we disagree, how we try to understand each other, that's where reason and freedom and truth are alive. And this is something which Gandhi shares. When Gandhi explains 
why he wrote Tim Svaraj in dialogue. He says, because in the Jain tradition, which he through his mother grew up with, uh, uh, he was told that whenever you have a difficult problem, deep problem, then you need to use dialogue. And dialogue has to be dialogue with the other. Uh, Gandhi wasn't always <laughs> on the ship from London to South Africa in 1908. He wasn't in, in a real dialogue with other people. Also Wittgenstein also wrote in a fictive dialogue. But in the case of Gandhi, in the case of Wittgenstein, the experience is that to understand what I can believe in, what I can commit myself to as truth, I have to converse with the other. And in order for that to be possible, the other has to be free and respected as a free being, equal to me. So this is the connection with the search for what is true uh, with freedom and nonviolence. Because only in a conversation with nonviolent can the reminders, the, um, the um, imagination, the experience, the wisdom of the other become real to me and become part of my growth towards truth. So this is what Wittgenstein discovered, the dialogic nature of truth and its intrinsic connection to nonviolence and democracy. And that was there also in Gandhi. So this is what they share. And also, I think they shared, which was very difficult, very, very difficult for the Western philosophy to, to, to accept. Uh, this may be the most difficult part, I call it the Peronian, Peronic part of, of Wittgenstein's and Socrates and Gandhi's philosophy, because there was a, a post-Hellenic philosopher called Piro, who thought that philosophy, at its, when, it's, when it's radically committed to reason, it understands that the search for truth is never ending, that what we achieve is deepening understanding, it's not a fixed truth. So there's always room for more deep and for more broader, for new impulses. And that's also why we need the other, and not only one other person, we need a community of equals that can search for truth together. And in this community, that's, that's Wittgenstein. And Gandhi adds, the life has to be simple enough so that our search for truth will not be burdened by all kinds of mad things which we don't understand. That's right. So technology will make us mad. Yeah. You know, we can't, we can't understand when I have my, my, whatever, this computer, you know, and we know that the rare earth metals in this computer that I use to talk with you, it comes from the Congo. I don't understand these people. I'm, I'm completely at, at a loss who I am, who is using this technology. Yeah. So that was Gandhi's great contribution. I think that technology has to be simpler. And that then is, it's a very, very far uh, the distance between the world we need yeah. and the world yeah. we have is unfortunately very, very great. So that's our struggle. That's right. That's our that's struggle. Uh, and the means and ends, the emphasis on never confusing the means with the end or the justifications thereof is probably uh, the key element there. So I was thinking, Thomas, yeah. from this grounding, I was wondering that isn't it this grounding that is enabling you and empowering you in a sense to persevere as a political activist mm -hmm. um, in a world or a, definitely your neighborhood. Let's just talk about your neighborhood. But certainly mm -hmm. that's true of the world also, where things have actually gone uh, quite contrary to what most of us expected 20 years ago. Yes. Um, because when you say, and I completely um, agree with the need to dialogue with the other, uh, and yet I do feel very overwhelmed sometimes when the other is somebody who uh, is almost advocating a mass annihilation of certain sets of yes. people that... Uh, yes they find to be unpleasing to them or, uh, you know, un, uh, um, yes. unworthy of cohabiting in the same society as them. So how do we deal with that? I mean, how are you struggling with that as a political yeah. activist? Yes. Um, well, um, it, it's difficult 
because uh, as you say, the last 20 years have brought an alliance between one, I deal with it in two ways. I try to understand what's happening. So there's a question of just of analytical clarity. Then there's a question of, of practical intervention. And in both, I mean, in both, we have to be humbly admit uh, the, the limits we have. Uh, I think we don't have, uh, at the moment, we don't have a satisfactory theory. We don't have one movement that would give us the answers and give us the right analysis. So I think what gives me the hope I have uh, is that the different movements, the women's movement, the environment movement, the democracy movement, the movement for uh, for the Dalits, uh, the movement in the socialist movement, uh, that all these movements, each of them has part of the answer, but we haven't formed a coalition which would give us a vision that inspires well enough. So we are all, you know, all, all are weak and small, but we can still, by intensifying the cooperation and, and the search together, we can uh, we can try to learn more. So that's one thing, that's the practice. And in the practice, I think what has to be, the, anal the analysis is that we have a very surprising, very sad, successful coalition between the authoritarian, fascist, right, the racists, with the market fundamentalist right. I have all kinds of things to say about that. I just want to note that it's an empirical fact that uh, the that coalition formed first in 1990s in Italy by Silvio Berlusconi in our part of the world. That coalition between market, uh, you know, mad market fundamentalists and uh, and very um, violent fascist tendencies. That coalition is strong, appeals to people uh, because that coalition seems to offer to some of us a way out. Most will die, but we can have a dignified life. That is the promise. So the, the larger promise that all of us could flourish, that larger promise seems so impossible. Our vision of how to provide flourishing life for all, the visions of the ecology movement, the women's movement, has been too abstract, too theoretical, and doesn't grip people. So I, I'll give you one example of how you know, the experience of truth, which I would like to undertake. I, I, I've done two big experiments the last 20 years. One, one has been the World Social Forum, where, which has been an effort to bring movements which all have something to offer, and none of the movements can offer enough. Bring them together in conversation, learn from each other. That's one experiment. The other experiment which I'm proud to be engaged in is the experiment to take the social democratic movement of the North of Europe and especially Nordic countries to this age. In 20th century, the social democratic Nordic countries were quite good at the national level in combining justice and prosperity. At the global level, it has not happened. The social democratic movement was pro-industry, pro-growth, and has failed to de deliver globally satisfying or promising solutions. But the ideals are correct. Democracy, social justice are, for me, you know, remain precious ideals. So the question of bringing in the ecological and the global justice issues into the Nordic social democratic tradition, that's my second experiment. Mm -hmm. And how to do this in practice? Well, this morning I was having conversations with my friends from the movements here, both social democrats and greens and feminists, what we can do. One, we, we don't have quick answers. What we know is we've had the last few years, we had Extinction Rebellion, a climate uh, direct action movement, which is trying to wake people up to the reality of climate change and its threats. Now, this movement fails to appeal to the majority of the people. We have not, we appeal to some, but we don't appeal to the majority. How to deal with that? One solution is just to be humble and go out and ask people, knock on everybody's door in Finland form a movement, have a few thousand people, go and knock on everyone's door and ask them. I'm here, I'm a climate activist, I'm an activist of social uh, for global justice. What do you think of, what, do you want, what can we share? What can we, 
what can we understand each other? And if we can do that, maybe then we could have, we could learn a lot. And maybe people who are not now worried, who, are, who don't want to share with the, but you know, the, the fascists, those who want to, want to annihilate the others, maybe they can come closer to us and maybe we can learn from them. And maybe then our society would be more ready for change. That's one. But these ideas are not, you know, these are, it's a, it's a long way yeah. to satisfactory answers. Yeah. But we yeah. are there. Yeah. And my experience is it's, it's better to try so, to do something than to, than to just curse the world. Oh, of course, always. And uh, I sometimes think of it as staying at the ropes. You know, if you think of the Amrit Manthan in our, you know, the uh, mythic churning of the ocean. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So the creation begins with the churning of the mythic ocean. Okay. okay. Yeah. And uh, there yes. are the asuras are on one side and the devas are on the other side. And okay. so I sometimes think that uh, these myths are meant to be eternal mm -hmm. realities. Mm -hmm. Because in some way that churning is perennial in, to, yeah. to the extent that as a species, we are always churning to s bring forth our better self. And mm -hmm. in the process, all sorts of stuff comes to the surface. And That's what I think. I'm, I'm perhaps, uh, you know, uh, I'm a more secular, modern person than some of my friends that <laughs> I have difficulties in, in, in finding soothing this appeal to the myths. But I do. I, maybe it resonates more with me now than it did 30 years ago. What do you say, Rajni? Well, look at it this way. Whether or not we refer to any mythology, uh, I find it very energizing that the degrowth community uh, translates itself in Africa as Ubuntu, mm -hmm. which yes. I'm told means that you are, therefore I am. Yes. In Latin America. It that's is a nice translation. Uh, that's the one I've always seen in those circuits. Uh, in, in, in Latin America, it is Buen Vivir, the good life. Yes. Where the good life means, I think, what Gandhi meant. Yes. Uh, in terms of clarity of purpose, scale, and fellow feeling. Uh, and in India, the word they find, the equivalent word they are, they are associating with degrowth is Sarvodaya. Yes. Mm -hmm. The well-being mm -hmm. of all. Yes. You see, so, I, yes. No, you were going to say something. No, no, I agree with that. I, I, it, and it's important you say Sarvodaya. You are more, you're more uh, uh, alive to the Ghana tradition than, than I have been. I've been using Svaraj in that place. But I think Sarvodaya may be better. Uh, no, but no. yes, I didn't like... uh, Because uh, there is, Sarvodaya is not possible without Swaraj. Mm -hmm. Yes. And without uh, Ahimsa. That's right. And then and Swaraj is not possible without Ahimsa. Uh, how, uh, in closing, Thomas, what uh, would you like to share with young people who are already on the journey in some way or the other? And sometimes they do feel daunted. Yes. Um, I, would, I would say, the, um, I think the... Uh, that to be part of the movement that tries to understand and tries to change, that's the best thing that can happen to a person. It's, the, it's a gift of life which we can uh, probably accept. Uh, and then the fact that we are not God, <laughs> that the world will, will not always, um, there's two, and this is Gandhian, I think, and many others, there's two things. One is we can't expect, the world is not such that when we snap our fingers, it will obey us. That's not our role in the world. And, uh, and, um, um, and the second is that there is hope. Uh, there is the hope that just the sheer fact, Rajin, that you are there and you try something. The fact that all this, and it's also a very grim fact of life that often the best people will not survive. Um, they will be killed, uh, but we can also be happy that they have been there. We can be inspired by their example, and we can try to stand by 
by the people who have, you know, who have not survived the struggle. Uh, and we should, uh, and there's also the question on one, we can be wrong. Mm. That's also, I think, very important in Gandhi, that nonviolence is necessary. Uh, respect for the other must all, always involve respect for those whose analysis and whose ideals seem so radically different from us that we find them difficult to comprehend. So maybe everything I've said is completely wrong. So the other, only by facing the other non-violently can I hope to learn more and see my limits and my mistakes better. Is so that, that's one part of the journey. True, but how you would you apply this even when the other is maybe trying to kill you? Well, I think there again, um, I mean, I haven't been in these situations, uh, but uh, some of my friends have. And I think, I don't know what to say. I'm inspired by, by one of Gandhi's responses when he said that if you can't, if you don't have the strength to fight the violent opponent non-violently, maybe you have to use violence to defend yourself. But that's always your weakness that will then uh, uh, be, at, uh, be the explanation, not your strength. That's but right. it's difficult. It's not a question I'm very good to address because I haven't, I've not faced those situations. I mean, in another part, my, my life is not like that. Yeah, yeah. Fortunately, I suppose, um, or of course. Mm. So other, other people will be... And yet you Maybe. inspire so many people through your teaching and your political activism, Thomas. So uh, would you like to make a kind of a closing comment? Yeah, yeah. On... let me say, well, one thing, I mean, we do, uh, this morning I was reading Immanuel Kant, the German Enlightenment philosopher. He has an essay called Zum Ewigen Frieden. Uh, it's about the eternal peace. And what I can do here, I can reread my, for my own uh, education, and I can read with my students. A vision from uh, 1790s of how a philosopher, a Prussian, East Prussian philosopher could imagine, have the strength to imagine the intrinsic connection between commitment to reason and freedom and democracy and nonviolence, and how he could see in 1790s how that commitment can have, can promise eternal peace and justice with which we're all living beings. So I can read the text and I can find clues to my practice and I can, can find existential, uh, I can find, uh, it, it, it can satisfy my, my existential needs and maybe the needs of my students and we can grow together. So that's one thing we do. Absolutely. And, and never underestimate the power of this because uh, we don't know which of your students may be another Gandhi. That's right. And we need not only Gandhis, we need also the ordinary workers who will do the Absolutely. political workers, the, the teachers, the, who will have and keep the ideas alive. And this happens every day. We must also remember that uh, we don't know when, you know, people are, people are complex beings. Yes. So the, the idealist side, the search for truth, the search for nonviolent community, is always one aspiration people have. And when space can be created for those aspirations to, to flourish, then things can be better. So I think there is hope, even though we can somehow, we, can, we must face it that today many things are, are difficult, yeah. but hope is there and people can grow and we can grow together. So that's what we can hope for and what we work for together. Thank you so much. And Thank you, Rajini. Thank you for doing this.